So I'm going to talk on the literature review. Uh, by the way, th this is something uh, still going on. It's in preparation. So why do we think that wisdom can be enhanced? So we define wisdom as a complex, multi-component trait that promotes well-being of the self and the society. Most of the traits, such as resilience, optimism, on which there are data, are about 25 to 40 percent genetic, which means that 75 percent to 60 percent are environmentally determined. But even that 25 to 40 percent part, which is genetic, is environmentally affected because environment and behavior impact gene expression. And there have been studies that show that you can increase optimism, resilience with psychosocial or other interventions. And finally, there are data suggesting that older people are wiser in some ways than the younger ones, suggesting that the wisdom may be affected by aging, by experience, by mentoring. And there are definitely data suggesting that people with certain kinds of brain trauma or brain disease go from being wise to being unwise, which means that the wisdom can be affected by environment and behavior. So we looked at two databases, PubMed and PsycInfo. I should add that we also had a third database. The name is Howard Nussbaum, who knew several <laughs> articles. And then for the search term that we used was wisdom, we found only one article on enhancement of wisdom. But, so we then focused on individual components of wisdom. I will show them in the next couple of slides. Uh, components such as compassion, empathy, emotional regulation, etc. And then they had to have intervention either in the title or the abstract, and of course English only. Uh, as happen, happens with Google searches, we found 2,714 articles of potential interest and finally ended up with 39 that were found to be relevant. And at least two authors examined each of these. So as I said, we found only one study that's focused on wisdom. The other 38 studies focused on specific components of wisdom. There were 19 articles on pro-social behaviors and mostly compassion and empathy. Uh, nine focused on emotional regulation, nine on spirituality, and there was one article on openness to new experience. We did not find a single article on social decision making, insight, decisiveness amid uncertainty, which are also components of wisdom. So this is actually the overall summary of the articles of the 37 articles uh, that focused on either pro-social behavior, emotional regulation, or spirituality. The two other articles, one was on wisdom and one was on um, openness to new experience. So the first uh, row that shows age of the people who were the subjects in the study. So four out of 19 studies on pro-social behavior focused on youth, that is children or adolescents, 15 were on adults. Emotional regulation, four youth, five adults. Spirituality was mostly adults. Most of the literature on wisdom focuses on general community, population at large, I was surprised to find that a majority of these articles were on were in people with physical or mental illnesses. There were some articles on community-based population. Uh, Pro-social behavior 10 were on community-based population, which means, uh, explain that to you later, but which means say students um, in school or college students or teenagers or adults, seniors, etc. Three on emotional regulation and one on spirituality were based on community-based samples. All others included people with physical illnesses or mental illnesses. So these numbers show people with physical or mental illnesses. Pro-social behavior, there's one article on physical illnesses, specifically cancer. Um, none in emotional regulation and six in spirituality. Uh, several of these were studies on people with cancer some included people with heart disease. The emotional illnesses, uh, these included things like major depression, 
generalized anxiety disorders, PTSD, uh, teenagers with behavior problems. Uh, majority of these studies were randomized, randomized controlled trials. Uh, again, majority were group interventions, 11, 6, 4. Uh, others were individual one-on-one -on -one interventions. Interestingly, technology uh, is playing a larger role in recent interventions. Total of 10 interventions use some kind of technology, not necessarily fancy, but at least online um, use of uh, interventions. So six on pro-social behavior, three on emotional regulation, and one on spirituality. Um, and the results, you all know there is a positivity bias in the literature. People who get negative results don't submit their articles for publication. And even if they submit it, they are less likely to be accepted. So any kind of intervention review you do, you have to keep in mind the positivity bias. So not surprisingly, majority of these articles found positive results. Um, some found mixed results. That means some positive findings, some negative, and five were purely negative. I'm glad there were some purely negative to support the validity of the review. Uh, I won't go into details of these for time, but I will summarize the findings later. So in terms of spirituality, there were, as I said, nine interventions. Six of them were in the US, two in Canada, one in Iran. The study subjects, as I said, one <coughs> included study of people with cancer, cardiovascular disease, migraine, then generalized anxiety disorder, major depression, and one was in homeless youth. Four of these were randomized controlled trials, so one using treatment as usual, and three had wait list controls. Five were individual interventions, four were group interventions. And these are the ki kind of interventions that people had used. Mindfulness best, four. One was based on cognitive behavior therapy. One, advanced care planning. One, art therapy. And two were teaching programs, teaching about spirituality. One in person and one was using audio CDs. The duration of these interventions for, was anywhere from two to nine weeks. Emotional regulation, uh, there were nine interventions. Uh, examples of these interventions. So one was a manualized emotional regulation, education, and practice. One was replacing parts of a standard cognitive behavior therapy with emotional regulation training for acceptance, tolerance, and active modification of negative emotions. Another was acceptance and commitment-based emotional regulation. And three used some kind of technology. One focused on attention bias modification. So what they did was if the kid was throwing temper tantrums, you ignore that. And so you focus your attention on the positive rather than the negative events. Play Mancer, actually I have not myself used it, but apparently it is a serious video game which people have used for a bunch of cognitive interventions. Uh, and then come one use outside versus inside um, emotion regulator. Um, Interventions using technology, um, so that online game for social cognition training in teenagers with high functioning autism, a mindfulness compassion video conference with nationally recruited young adult cancer survivors. Let me skip this because of again time. There's only one intervention that specifically mentioned wisdom. This was a very small study of 12 Vietnam veterans aged 61 to 70 years who were already receiving PTSD counseling. What they did was they randomized them to two groups. One group received the standard um, PTSD counseling. The other group, they added to that semi-structured life review therapy. And then they measured wisdom using um, Webster scale, self-assessed wisdom scale, and they found their significant improvement, especially in emotional regulation and openness components. They also found significant improvement in depression. So instead of summarizing these studies, lots of limitations of these studies. Uh, as I said, only one study used a scale for wisdom, but others used various components. Uh, positivity bias in published literature, as I mentioned. 
usually small sample sizes. Although some studies did have larger sample sizes, like about 800. Um, all the majors, not surprisingly, were su subjective. Uh, any kind of meta-analysis is not possible because the amount of information collected and given about even things like age, the type of subjects, majors use, intervention, statistics, so variable. Uh, no study had longer term follow-up, even if there is a six-month study, whether the improvement was maintained six months uh, or a year later, couldn't find that. An important question is, even if you see improvement on a scale, for um, even depression or wisdom, some emotional regulation, is that improvement trans transferred to the everyday life? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how one would do that, but at least that's something to keep in mind because that's really the real test of a uh, successful intervention, that it affects your uh, daily functioning. Also, very few studies looked at the improvement in relationship to age, gender, culture, context, et cetera. Nonetheless, I think there are the positive thing is that it does show that at least components of wisdom can be improved through psychosocial or behavioral intervention, at least in the short term. Coming from medicine side, I mean, one, feel, one thing I realized after reading these articles was that we may be underestimating the value of wisdom for health and healthcare. Because as I said, number of these interventions were based on or were conducted in people with physical or mental illnesses, and these people improved um, in terms of their compassion, uh, emotional regulation, spirituality, etc. Uh, I think many of you know that spirituality is now a formal, official component of palliative and hospice care. Uh, so there is already spirituality in medicine to that extent. Um, Interventions for pro-social behaviors, emotional regulation in people with mental illnesses like personality disorder are really meaningful because there are no effective treatments for borderline or other personality disorders. Um, similarly, teaching of wisdom enhancing strategies in schools, both for children and parents, could be useful in reducing the behavior problems that occur later in life or even at that time. Um, and I think this is something this is something that has been done with other traits like resilience, optimism, and social engagement. There are so many studies showing that these traits are associated with better health, greater longevity, and there are some studies showing that they may have positive impact on the health, in effect reducing the healthcare cost. So one thing to think about is how studies of in enhancing wisdom components in people with physical and mental illnesses can result in reduced healthcare costs. So the future is research. I think the type of studies needed are obviously larger hypothesis-based randomized controlled trials with appropriate controlled groups, use of validated majors. Again, I think we are near future. We are stuck with subjective majors for many of those things, but at least we can use techniques like ecological movement reassessment. So instead of one-time assessment, do this several times, the burst majors, even over a period of time uh, at specific periods. Uh, association with other health-related majors. Most of the time, the studies include as as association with well-being, but we, should, we need to go beyond that and also look at impact on physical and mental health. Uh, biological majors, including uh, biomarkers. Again, there are studies associating biomarkers with resilience, optimism, same thing needs to happen with wisdom real life implications, including healthcare cost, and then something at a much broader scale, you know, there are group interventions. But group intervention, they looked at outcome in individuals. One should look at outcome for the whole group. If we do that, then actually we can, just like there, are, there is family therapy. So there should be family wisdom therapy and look at what happens. Organization level, community level, and maybe even national level. Maybe this is something that pertains to what Bob was talking about, how the, the um, national wisdom may be going down. So uh, the United Nations has the happiness index and they rate the different countries on the happiness index. And the countries are now competing with one another, not only to increase their GDP, the gross domestic product, but happiness index. 
So should we not about think about wisdom index? Because that really is maybe more meaningful, more eudaimonic rather than the heronic uh, happiness index. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dilip, for this great presentation. Um, I have one comment and a question. Uh, my comment is about the last point that you made. Um, at, um, at the University of Helsinki in Finland, they are actually doing an intervention uh, that they call a co uh, co-passion and organization. So it's right. trying to in, you know, introduce uh, compassion in organizations. Um, which are companies, but also in communities. And what they found is that there's actually, first of all, compassion does increase, but there's also a spillover effect that uh, it affects other people, you know, that yeah. weren't even part of the intervention. Um, so that's my comment. But my question is, you know, one of the things that you included in your literature review was um, spirituality intervention. I was just wondering if you can comment a little bit about um, how is wisdom equal, similar, different to spirituality? So we did a literature review of the various components that different people have included. And we found that spirituality was included in about a third of the definitions. So I would say at this stage, spirituality does not seem to be a component that is included in a majority of the definitions used, but nonetheless, one third is a significant proportion. I personally think that spirituality should be a part of wisdom, but again, it depends on how you define spirituality. Spirituality is different from religiosity, and there are different definitions and different scales for measuring spirituality. Uh, I think it's an open question, uh, but question I think that clearly needs discussion and uh, I think it's really an important question. Uh, from the medical side, as I said, now for the hospice team or palliative care team, you need to have a person who is a spirituality guide. Uh, again, that depends on the specific patient. The patient may not care for having one, but the patient may insist on it. And the patient may say, that he want, he or she wants a person from a specific religion or so on. So I think right now, the definition is left to the individual, which is the way it should be. Thank you for that very thought-provoking presentation. Um, this came up in uh, Bob's talk too, at least for me, uh, teaching wisdom to children. I mean, what does it look like to teach wisdom to children and what would a wise child look like? I mean, we often associate ch uh, wisdom with experience and aging and not with children. So I wonder if you have reflections on that. I mean, th this is an issue probably we are going to have a discussion about education later. But I mean, in a way, as parents, what we do, and the teachers, good teachers too, is really have our children learn more about compassion, uh, share the toys with your sibling, and so on and so forth. And then emotional regulation, throwing temper tantrums is not good, uh, being decisive, um, accepting uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, Bob talked about that. And I said that we, our focus right now in the society is increasing IQ. And so people do better in their math tests, et cetera. But really, wisdom should be a part of the teaching. And that should be teaching. First, we have to teach the teachers so they can teach the children. Right. Similarly, the parents need to be taught to do that. And I'm looking at it not from moralistic perspective, but really even healthcare <coughs> perspective as a physician. Because I do think that if we taught and help the kids grow up with this, they're going to see fewer behavior problems. If we see fewer behavior problems, then that'll, it'll reduce delinquency, it could reduce some of the crimes. Uh, and so on, the substance use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there have been some sort of sociological studies of different kind done actually in Chicago. Uh, Carl Bell um, did something where they found that working with the kids and the parents and the teachers significantly reduced the rate of um, 
offenses, legal offenses committed by them when they grew older and they are a comparison group that did not receive it. So, I do, so, but, so in addition to the legal aspects, again I am focusing on the health aspect, I, I think that the physical and mental health can be significantly improved if we, again that is a testable hypothesis, we do not know that. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, talk and it's a really daunting task that you took on um, <laughs> given that you are entertaining a wide notion of wisdom and you have been, you know, looking broadly. I just wanted to add to your collection um, of studies that, you know, we have been doing in the 1990s intervention work that was focused on exploring the effect of a dyadic setting versus a monadic setting on wisdom related performance. Yeah. And we found very positive effects across all of our dimensions of wisdom. That may be an interesting uh, study to also bear in mind. And we have also done work that intervenes in one of the dimensions which is we call value relativism or tolerance because we felt the world could do with a bit more tolerance if possible. And again, uh, we were able to show that this is feasible. Um, and then there's another area of studies in a similar way as uh, Monica was referring to the community work in Finland. There's this whole area of post-traumatic growth yeah. And uh, most, uh, there are a number of studies that actually look at therapeutical interventions because, of course, with a wide notion of wisdom, you're really moving into the realm of, um, of therapeutical interventions as well. Yep. So I'd, I'd like to encourage, um, you know, to, to take those into account. And your final point I really liked very much, um, linking back to Bob's pledge at the beginning this morning, I think it would be very exciting to think about implementable features, indices, statistics uh, that would lend themselves to compare countries. Because for me, this is one lever that would actually have a chance to move the needle because we are living in a century, uh, well, maybe less than a century, but we are living in times that are fixed on rankings. and countries look to rankings and are very, you know, um, cognizant of where they rank. And um, on the OECD level, on the United Nations level, there's a major push to expand the range of indices. And so I was just wondering whether one could, for instance, discuss um, the usability of um, a sociologist, uh, I think his name is, I forget, maybe someone knows his name, he, t he wrote about uh, social capital and he found a way to actually distinguish communities with regard to the degree of social capital. So I'm just, you know, making yeah, suggestions yeah, where, where we could look. I really applaud you uh, for this last point. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Ursula. Actually, one, the first point about the study, no, thank you for that. And one of the reasons for presenting this here was to find out from you what other studies are there. Because any Google searches, I mean, they are, quite inadequate, you miss uh, a lot. So I will appreciate if all of you can send me um, references to the studies uh, th th and I will be happy to send you the ones that we have included so far. So anything missing, please uh, add to that. And uh, your second point also, I, I agree with you that there is needs to be something. And this is something that probably we need to develop through consensus that, and something that is measurable. I, I don't think it is impossible because there are objective indices. There is a paper in Science published some time back. They looked at objective indices of well-being in a community. So those indices included things like um, a rate of unemployment, um, rate of uh, crime, um, and some well-being level that are um, measured actually by the CDC, for, for, for example, in the US on a regular basis. Um, so there are things that may be available already. We're doing anything new is, is not <laughs> likely. Is not likely. But we can use those. So anyway, so I think uh, I'd love to hear some suggestions so we can come up with some uh, product like that. Okay. I just have a really quick question. So your pre I was really interested in your presentation, but one of the things that came to mind was. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on whether or not some aspects of wisdom are more teachable than others. 
So if, like, for instance, maybe in some of the dimensions of wisdom can be more easily taught, or maybe some of them you really have to have either the relevant life experience, for example, to really truly grasp it. Uh, my sense is it would vary from uh, person to person. I think it probably would depend on the family in which you are raised. I mean, some families, for example, <coughs> I would think that everybody's emotionally regulated and others where there is very high emotional expression for everything. So there it might be different. Um, um, I think one of the hardest thing would be, and we see that in politics, again, Bob referred to that, acceptance of diversity of opinion. That I think I have certain types of values, but I can accept the fact that somebody else may have different values. And that doesn't necessarily mean that other person is evil or dumb, but that's one of the, that's the value relativism. I think that's one of the harder things to teach, at least in some, um, some sectors. Uh, so, thank you. Oh.